Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Name Dragon, and welcome to what is hopefully a quick video on, um, <clears throat> definitions in the never-ending debate between science and young Earth creationism. Apologies to my guest Josh for that jab, but it's true. The scientific discipline does not support creationism. Nevertheless, he will offer up his take on micro and macro evolution for us, and I'll show him where and how he's, well, just wrong. You know the drill. Take it away, Josh. So what's all this talk about macro and micro evolution? In this video, we're going to talk about what the difference is and why it's important. Okay, so today we're talking about evolution. Now, I think I've mentioned my position before, but I feel sort of obligated to do it every time I do a video like this. I am a young earth creationist, but I like to identify as a lowercase y young earth creationist. Meaning that is what I believe and I can argue it just fine, that's my position and everything, but I won't split hairs over it and I could see myself being convinced of a different position. To the first, I have to say that I know of no significant talk about the differences between micro and macro evolution amongst biologists. It's not a big deal within the science as both utilize the same underlying mechanisms. There are well-defined terms in biology that refer to nothing more than the scale of change you may expect over different amounts of time. Micro, as the name implies, talks about small-scale evolution over short periods of time, and macro is large-scale over long periods of time. Easy peasy. To the latter, I'm glad to hear that you're open to reconsidering your position, however, I took a minute to look over the social media you've tied to um, Christian sophistry, Josh, and know that you already follow the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson and Richard Dawkins. If you are honestly open to such reconsideration, I cannot believe you've actually listened to much they have to say. Either that, or you didn't understand what they're talking about when they go on about evolution or deep time. So, are you honest? but haven't listened to them or they're talking over your level, or are you dishonest and not actually willing to reconsider your position? Let me be fair and admit that those may not be the only positions available, just the ones I can think of. Anyways, now that you've introduced yourself, I'm going to play something from very near the end of your video. If we insist on having productive discourse, I think that starts with accurately defining terms. So, you get this video. I played this at the beginning because I agree that this is critically important. And since we're talking about a scientific discipline with prescriptive definitions, when necessary I will provide them for us both out of the Oxford Dictionary of Biology 7th edition printed in 2015. This is one of the most up-to-date and authoritative sources for definitions for terms used in the field of biology. I'm sure you won't disagree with that. After all, a formal discipline should have formal definitions. Macro evolution is what scientific naturalists, theistic evolutionists, and some old earth creationists recognize as evolution. This is the general idea that life on Earth emerged somewhere around 4 billion years ago and has developed since then into the diverse world that we see today. Proponents of this view will identify this view as just evolution. This is what people mean when they say evolution. But people that are of different paradigms and different views on origins, they will identify this as macroevolution. The term was just developed as a distinguishing of the concept. The whole point is just to be able to identify it within its own respective paradigms. Um... I'd love to see the source you have for these claims. Because that's not the definition of evolution or the definition of macroevolution. And the two are not synonymous. And the term wasn't developed to recognize a paradigm. It was developed to differentiate between two different scales upon which evolution operates. So we're all on the same page, as I promised. 
let me provide better definitions from the Oxford Dictionary of Biology to give meanings that these words genuinely have in the field of biology. If you want other definitions, you'd better justify why we should use those. Anyways, macroevolution is defined as evolution on a relatively large scale involving, for example, the emergence of entire groups of organisms, such as the flowering plants or the mammals. I can see why you would object to this definition, as it makes clear that the entire kingdom known as mammals evolved out of something else. But how does that compare to the definition of evolution? The gradual process by which the present diversity of plant and animal life arose from the earliest and most primitive organisms. That's all that's needed, though it does continue for clarity, which is believed to have been continuing for at least the past 3,000 million years. Until the middle of the 18th century, it was generally believed that each species was divinely created and fixed in its form throughout its existence. So if you like, you can try to claim that macroevolution can be conflated with evolution as a whole, but the reality is that macroevolution only refers to any period within evolution over sufficient time as to give rise to a novel branch of life. Can we agree to use these definitions in future videos instead of the things you've been putting out there? Because then you'll be talking the same language as the people whom you are attempting to reach. Microevolution is where the real controversy is, where people really get upset at the distinguishing of the terms. Microevolution is a small aspect of the greater evolutionary theory that all people accept and recognize as truth. Although it is accepted by young Earth creationists and some old Earth creationists, they're the only people that actually identify it with this term. Literally all microevolution is, is the recognition of the evidence that we can see and observe today. But people that use this term, although they accept the evidence that everybody else accepts as truth, they disagree with the conclusions that are drawn by scientific naturalists. I would think you'd see for yourself the contradiction you've created. If everyone accepts it, then it's not where the controversy lies. The controversy lies in the fact that you and your fellow travelers assume there's some magical change in the laws of nature that prevents the passage of time to turn microevolution into macroevolution. The difference between the two, after all, is nothing but time. Don't believe me? As promised, here's the actual definition of microevolution from the Oxford Dictionary of Biology. Evolution on a relatively small scale, involving the emergence of new species or new groups below the species level, such as races and subspecies. Now, you say that you accept microevolution. I'd be curious, Josh, if you accept it with this new definition. If you agree that new species can develop from an existing species, why can't future species developing from that new species be so different from the original parent species as to represent a new genus. And if the children within that genus differentiate far enough, why can this not become a new family? Where's the line? Why is there a line? Prove that your line exists. Or do you just think that not enough time has passed for this to occur? If so, why? What reason do you have to reject physics and geology? Do go on though, I don't mean to bog you down with the fact that if microevolution continues over long periods of time, it by definition becomes macroevolution, and that we can demonstrate with the evidence you claim not to refuse that those long periods of time exist. It seems a lot to me that there's this common misconception that Christians just deny the evidence that is out there. Or some atheists are just so bent on slandering Christians that they don't want to actually learn what our worldview is and what we proclaim in it. And no, Christians do not simply ignore the evidence that is out there. Well, most of the time. 
We recognize the same data and observations that everybody else has observed and recognized. We just come to different conclusions that are consistent with the evidence, but in different paradigms. Okay, we need to define another term here, and I'm not qualified to do so. What exactly do you mean by Christians? Because I know many, many more Christians who accept the evidence and consequently accept evolutionary theory than I do Christians who cherry-pick the evidence and deny the reality of evolutionary theory. I leave it to you to present a definition of Christian, but if this definition doesn't include those Christians who accept evolution lock, stock, and barrel, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to use a different term, perhaps creationist, which already exists and represents those people who have a problem with evolutionary theory. Wait, can, can we hear one thing one more time? And no, Christians do not simply ignore the evidence that is out there. Well, most of the time. By your own admission, you deliberately disregard evidence that fails to conform to your world view. Fossil record, genome comparisons, gene comparisons, radiometric dating, either the laws of physics used to be so different that nothing could have existed a few thousand years ago, or evolution happened, as described above. Take your pick. Either you accept the findings of science, or be a creationist. Take your pick. Part of this stems from your notion that you choose a paradigm before evaluating evidence. While I could get deeper into it, the only paradigm needed by scientists is there appears to be a universe and we can study it. It's literally it. Everything else, including the notion that the laws of the universe don't change, is a consequence of our study of the universe. That's how a devout Christian can become the father of evolutionary theory, as Darwin indeed was both at the time. Darwin's college education resulted in a bachelor's degree of theology, and yet he went on to recognize how evidence from biology was best explained through the simple mechanisms of non-random survival of semi-randomly varying organisms. Learn the facts, determine what best explains them, then adopt a worldview that fits the facts and explanations, not the other way around. Oh, and when new facts arise, test your worldview against them again. So, young Earth creationists accept concepts like adaptation and survival of the fittest and a lot of the other evidences that have been found in the past couple of centuries. But really the past couple of decades. But we don't think that this small window of history that we have available to us that we can see and observe today points to an accurate representation of the past four and a half billion years. No offense intended, but could you stop lying? When you claim it's really only the past couple of decades, you intentionally dismiss the overwhelming evidence gathered by Darwin in the 19th century that demonstrates extreme examples of artificial evolution of crops and domestic animals, for which we have evidence and examples going back to the beginning of recorded history some 10,000 years ago or so. You do not get to pretend. You do not get to pretend that the cultivation of cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, brussels sprouts, collard greens, and kohlrabi from Brassica oleracea over the course of thousands of years never happened, nor that aurochs were tamed and developed into multiple breeds of cow, which we see today, again, documented over the course of several thousand years. Believe it or not, when we dig up bones, that's an observation. We then date them through tree rings or carbon dating or a similar radiometric method, and those are all still observations. These are data points, 
facts that you don't get to claim are dependent on someone's paradigm. The minute you do this, you've excused yourself from the debate, because when you do, you are asserting that the laws of physics mysteriously and magically changed to fit your narrative somewhere along the line, which doesn't fit the evidence either, because we're here. And of course, that would also mean that you can't make the argument from fine-tuning, so I hope to never find that in one of your videos. After all, you've just argued that the very laws of physics changed during written history. And they'd have to, for your narrative to work. Therefore, God maintained life in defiance of the laws of physics, and he doesn't mean to fine-tune anything. The only way to argue against radiometric dating that creates the fossil record stretching back billions of years is to argue against the laws of physics. And unless you're arguing that your god faked the fossil record and the evidence from cosmology for an old Earth, we would then see the evidence for the changing of the laws of physics because predictions about what we should see in the fossil record wouldn't fit the hypothesis that the laws of physics haven't changed. And if your god faked all of this to make the universe appear old, then the universe cannot be evidence for your god's existence, in which case the argument from design and beauty fail too. Because they exist the way they do because god had to make it so in order to create the appearance that there is no god. Creationist arguments are inherently self-contradictory when examined in full. But you still have a few more points to make, so... Please, proceed. Microevolution is not a different view of evolution. It's just a stricter acknowledgement of what the evidence means. And it takes a different logical route in the conclusive analysis. It does none of those things. It merely defines a subset of evolution that is either between or within species. It's incumbent upon you to show that once two species spawn from a parent species, further speciation events would be prohibited from crossing the line into macroevolution. You actually have to demonstrate this, not just assert that it can't happen. So far, all you've done is fail to correctly define any of the terms which you are using. And just to be clear, this video is not meant to push young earth creationism. It's meant to facilitate productive discourse. Because anyone that says that young earth creationism is an inherent denial of the evidence is either spreading lies about Christianity in order to make it seem like the uneducated position, or they're avoiding having to engage with Christians on this topic because it takes actual work to learn what people believe in different worldviews. No, the simple fact is that young earth creationists do not understand the science or the evidence. You have proven this by having every single one of your definitions simply be false. I'm sorry, Josh, but you are ignorant on this topic, and time and again every young earth creationist has proven to either be ignorant or lying. So believe it or not, I'm giving you the better verdict. You do not understand the evidence. You do not even know what the terms mean, except how your fellow creationists have falsely defined them for you. Honestly engage in researching what real biologists have to say, what evidence is actually out there. Don't default to creationist explanations of the evidence, except only the explanation that fits the evidence without presupposing an outcome. I'm a named dragon, and I hope you've all learned a little bit more about how not to try and define terms when they're already formally defined in the arena which you used to use them. Josh, I have a feeling that we'll meet again, but I hope I've helped you think a little bit deeper about your ideas and claims. Thank you all, and have a good night.